and gentlemen, I'm Krishna C. Nadella, and this is State of Mind. This season is being produced with Manhattan Neighborhood Network's Youth Channel. The Youth Channel is a cable and multimedia platform that focuses on highlighting media created by youth, for youth, while providing a pipeline for action. Today's topic is about Muslims in America. Many Americans, including our current president, draw little distinction between the violent ideologies of extremist groups and mainstream Islam. As a result, there is often an anti-Muslim backlash in the wake of attacks, despite overwhelming condemnation of terrorism and the use of the Quran to justify mass murder among practicing Muslims. For Muslims, this condemnation can already add to the existing pressure of dealing with Islamophobia, discriminating them both personally and professionally. Yet like most prejudices in the world, lack of education is ultimately the primary driver of fear, hate, and ignorance. Back with us to once again talk about this timely topic is Dr. Marley Balaji of the Hindu American Foundation. Marley, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Krishna. So to kind of level set, Marley, I think we can all somewhat agree that ever since 2001, 9-11 specifically, Muslims have been a constant narrative in the public context of uh, social and geopolitical issues. Is this new to American uh, narratives, or is this something that's always been there within the history of America that we just haven't noticed as much? Outgroups have always been part of American history. Uh, in order to build a collective American identity, there's always going to be in-groups and out-groups. And every major group has experienced some form of outgrouping or another, some more extreme than others, African Americans, uh, First Nations people, uh, for example, Jews dealing with high levels of anti-Semitism from the late 19th century all the way through World War II, um, Italian Americans, Irish Americans. Um, so the outgrouping is not new. Um, I think with Muslims over the last 15 to 20 years, um, the impact of overseas conflict mm -hmm. has had an amplified effect on Muslim Americans. Um, but what they're going through is not dramatically different than what many outgroups have experienced. Okay. So if the college environment is an environment that typically has helped progress social change, what can millennials do, and of all creeds and races, to help with the narrative to counter what's being put out in the news today, which is somewhat of a negative stereotype of Muslims? I think the first thing that millennials have to do is understand that Islam in this country has been around for over 400 years. Okay. In it this country? Islam ha came with slaves. Many slaves were Muslim. And in fact, the uh, humiliation that um, Muslim slaves had to endure, uh, for example, being forced to eat uh, parts of pig, which obviously um, uh, Muslims do not eat, uh, you know, was part of their forced socialization into the United States, uh, not the United States, the American colonies, and then ultimately um, what became America. Um, at the same time, I think a lot of millennials need to stop grouping all Muslim Americans into one batch. For example, the majority of Muslims in this country are African American. Really? Okay? The majority of Arab Americans in this country are Christian. And I think there's oftentimes this uh, conflation between the two that is not accurate. More importantly, the stories of different Muslim American subgroups vastly differ. Whether it's an African American Muslim whose journey into Sunni Islam started with the embrace of the Nation of Islam 40 or 50 years ago, varies from the Iranian uh, Shia Muslim mm -hmm. or the Ahmadiyya Muslim from Pakistan who escaped persecution because Ahmadiyyas are considered heretics. Mm -hmm. Um, or mainstream Sunni Muslims, uh, depending on their um, cultural origin. So in this case, understanding that Muslims are not just one group, 
uh, is fundamental to understanding um, that these gr groups have their own diverse uh, ways of living. And so even an empathetic approach involves trying not to homogenize or abstract a group. So that was very informative, and I'll be the first to admit I didn't realize all the various forms and approaches to Islam. On that note, though, what can academic institutions do to help raise that awareness? And more importantly, what is their responsibility in all of this? I think there needs to be a critical awareness, okay? And one of the things that I am concerned about is in academia's attempts or even the media's attempts to highlight discrimination against Muslim Americans, um, there isn't a critical assessment of um, what is happening uh, among large parts of, um, I don't want to say Muslim society, because that's very diverse and it doesn't highlight um, you know, that, that diversity. But there is a lot of internal change that's happening among the global Muslim diaspora that needs to be acknowledged. And I think a lot of times academics are reluctant to understand that. For example, Wahhabism as a very real threat, primarily to other Muslims, mm -hmm. but obviously you look at, for example, um, I'll just point out the rise of Wahhabism in parts of the Indian subcontinent. Mm -hmm. Their goal is to wipe out non-believers and whether those non-believers they view as Shias, as Hindus, as Buddhists, as Christians, that's something that needs to be acknowledged. And the reason why it needs to be acknowledged is that in order to really take a proactive approach in highlighting the diversity, mm -hmm. the fluidity, and the, the fundamental Americanness of Muslims in the US, it needs to be highlighted that all of these groups have various degrees of internal dynamics and their own um, issues of social and cultural change. So I think you and I can sit here and have an educated conversation, and I can be open-minded to say I need to learn more. Yeah. But when I hear statements such as wiping out other ethnic classes, um, that's a very juicy tidbit for the media, per se. Yeah. And it creates a social stigma. At the same time, I don't think most people are aware of other religions that even have that component, component where you do wipe out entire uh, race or creed. And I may be incorrect in that statement, but the narrative becomes one where it's of fear and of concern about what's happening. One, where does the media fit in all of this? And two, is this something that's actually you know, relevant in all religious bodies and we just don't socialize it as much as we should? I think that the major issue we have is everything is put into the moment without appreciating the long arc of history. For example, Wahhabism was in many ways a response by extremely conservative Muslim thought leaders to what they felt was the rising materialism uh, uh, particularly in the Arab world. Wahhabism started in uh, the Middle East mm -hmm. and then spread to other parts of the world. However, what you talked about in terms of destroying others, I mean, that was a fundal, fundamental part of Christian expansion, you know, into other parts of the world. I mean, when they went, uh, you know, when, for example, Catholic explorers went into parts of South America, uh, Central America, they weren't there, you know, right. to say, hey, indigenous tribes, uh, let's all get along. Their primary goal was convert right. or be killed. Right. And so, again, I think we have a very short-sighted view at times to say, oh, what's happening now is somehow unique in history. It's mm -hmm. not. The long arc of history shows us that history always repeats itself and that religions that seek to expand always mix their expansion with both the, what we call the soft approach, which, and I put soft in air quotes, of proselytizing. Mm. And if that doesn't work, the hard approach. Right. I mean, even Buddhism didn't spread entirely peacefully in its early 
expansion period under Ashoka. So mm -hmm. again, we need to contextualize all of these things. So it does definitely sound like a little bit more education would go a long way in terms of understanding that what we're seeing is actually not that unique. And yeah. I, I want to be careful with that because I'm sure that would come across as potentially being offensive to some, but yeah. it's only because they may not have the perspective of just how religious organizations have conducted in the past. Absolutely. All right, so let's move on to our, my next question. In your perspective, you work for the Hindu American Foundation. From your professional perspective, what is the general consensus regarding Islam? Is it treated in the same capacity as other religions? Kind of building off what we just talked about, but let's fast forward to 2017. Is, is the narrative being fair to Islam considering we have social media, we have the internet, we have access to information, is what we see what we get, or do we as a society need to do more? It depends on how you frame Islam. And so in my work with the Hindu American Foundation, one of the things that I point out is that religions such as Hinduism, Islam, Sikhism, are not new to this country. As I mentioned, the, the longstanding history of uh, Islam in the U.S. as part of the American social fabric, um, or Hinduism having been in this country and influenced American thought for well over two centuries, mm. um, and Sikhism, the, the arrival of Sikh laborers into the U.S. via Angel Island in the late 19th century is something that's often overlooked. So these communities have existed, and, and these religious traditions have existed in this country for years. We just haven't bothered acknowledging or engaging with them. And when you go back to Islam, I think it's not so much Islam the religion, okay. to be honest, that's being framed. I think it's the cultural, quote unquote, newness of the immigrant populations that are largely Muslim. Keep in mind, the way that Islam was treated um, was not necessarily equitable, but it was a little bit more benign in the way it was framed in the 1960s when Muhammad Ali, right. sorry, Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay, that's right. Changed his name to Muhammad Ali. Lou Alcindor changed his name yeah. to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So you did have uh, a general understanding of what Islam was from a very African-American-centric view. Right. However, when a large number of uh, Muslim uh, Americans uh, over the last 15 to 20 years have come from places like Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, it changes the conversation. Right. So is there, I guess the best way to look at it is, if we were to look at this calendar year, 2017, brand new president in the White House, and one of the first acts was the Muslim travel ban. Mm -hmm. But it goes to your point where it was certain select countries. Yeah. It really wasn't a Muslim travel ban. It was a s you know, more of a pinpointed view on certain countries from the standpoint of how they're perceived in the larger global scale. What is the responsibility of our global leaders? What are your thoughts on the Muslim travel ban? And you know, what do they need to do to not only be relevant in 2017 from the I think a social standpoint, but also more importantly, heal some of the wounds that I think are still very open in this day and age. Well, first off, I thought that the travel ban was primarily a symbolic one because it actually doesn't do anything in terms of uh, whether it's immigration or even um, being used as a quote unquote deterrent mm -hmm. against uh, extremism. Keep in mind, the majority of extremists in this country, whether they're religiously motivated or not, are homegrown, American-born. Even um, those who commit acts in the name of Islam have largely been American-born and raised. So a travel ban is ineffective okay. in, in, in that regard. And again, it seemed to be more of a, of a showmanship act rather than anything else. But as far as global leaders, I think one of the things that global leaders have to acknowledge is that migration patterns are going to fundamentally change on a number of factors. Global poverty, climate change, um, political instability, all of, all of which I think are, are interrelated with one another. And they have to figure out ways to acclimate new populations. If you look at the reason why 
the U.S. has been remarkably stable when it comes to terror and, and safe. Uh, you know, so this is considered a, a stable period ver versus 2001. Versus 2001, um, you know, you look at, you know, parts of Europe, for example, right. France, Belgium, uh, where terror uh, alerts happen more often, sure. with more frequency than than, and I and I'm not saying terror acts. I'm just saying even terror alerts. Alerts, right? A lot of that has to do with acclimation and acculturation of communities that essentially are left kind of to their own devices mm. and thus are more susceptible to being radicalized. So let's take that one step further now. We see the radicalization, we see the terrorism, we see the extremism, and I want to be very clear, the extreme uh, terrorism that's happening within parts of, uh, of Islam. What is the community, the Islam community's responsibility to speak out on it? Now I acknowledge full and foremost that they have spoken on in the past and they have made a point to um, you know, denounce the actions that are happening. Is there more that they should be doing? You know, I don't know if denouncing terrorism is necessarily going to um, lead to any, any fundamental changes. I mean, I think denouncing terrorism is kind of a duh thing to do. I think what might be a more constructive means of engagement is working more closely with communities mm -hmm. where there continues to be levels of skepticism. For example, uh, Muslim American uh, religious uh, leaders may want to proactively engage with Jewish leaders mm -hmm. or Hindu leaders um, to really understand um, and vice versa. I, I, it's, it's a two-way two right. conversation on what can be done to build mutual trust and respect between communities. Because I think proactively speaking, there has to be a better a level of engagement among all religious groups in terms of what common areas they can collaborate on. Uh, they're not going to always agree, but at the same time, this is what the essence of coalition building is. You build coalitions towards goals, right. not towards you know needing everyone to engage in groupthink. Um, and last but not least, I, I really think that you know the onus should not be on the Muslim American community when it comes to this idea of terror. I think we need to look at terror as a, a, an, an ideology and a way of act, acting that transcends any one religious group. So to that point then, playing the role of John Q. Public here, is the media not doing its proper job in terms of showing terrorism as being faceless and nameless versus maybe skewing the narrative towards one ethnic group versus another. Part of that might be true, but I think there's a bigger issue here. The way we consume news mm -hmm. is highly segregated and compartmentalized mm -hmm. until we stop kind of the fragmented uh, way we consume news. We're going to continue constructing our own reality based on the information we consume. So you talked about different cultures getting together and having a narrative, having a conversation, really coming to the center. But you also mentioned in the same breath that within Islam, there's differing factions, there's differing points of view. What type of work needs to be done within the Islamic community? Uh, because clearly there's not one consolidated message, per se. I don't know if there's ever going to be a consolidated message among the Muslim American community or any other community for that uh, matter. There's okay. always going to be tensions. Right. Uh, what I think is going to be critical is really understanding the roles that culture, um, socioeconomic status, and interpretation mm -hmm. play into the way that d different communities build their identities and interact with one another. And I think Muslim Americans have been having this conversation, mm -hmm. but I think that there's always going to be continued areas of disagreement, both within that community and with others. So final question, what teaching point can be made with regard to the socialization of Muslims in this country? I think the, the number one teaching point is to really understand that 
the religiosity of the Muslim American community. I want to just repeat that again. The religi the religiosity. The religiosity. See, okay. The religiosity, the scale of religiousness Thank among uh, Muslim Americans is not um, homogenous. Mm -hmm. It's not uniform. And I think Muslim Americans really do uh, need to present themselves as a diverse community mm. and ensure that people don't just assume that a Muslim American woman, for example, is going to wear a hijab right. or that needs to speak Arabic right. to be a Muslim American or even be practicing to identify as one. Excellent. Well, listen, this is a topic that could go on for many more episodes and we definitely look forward to talking about it at a later date. But I always enjoy having you on the show, Marley, and thank you for joining us again on State of Mind. I always enjoy being here. Thanks so much, Krishna. On that note, that'll wrap up our show for today. I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Marley Balaji of the Hindu American Foundation. If you like what you saw in today's episode, please like, share, comment, or subscribe to the following social media platforms at the end of the episode. We'd also like to thank the Youth Channel's team for their support in this production. If you'd like to learn more about the Manhattan Neighborhood Network's Youth Channel, please visit mnn.org youth. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. And remember, every life is a book. Make yours a bestseller. Have a good night.